Hello everyone, I am Jonathan from Crafty Lupin Publishing, and this is how you play Gordian Layers. Gordian Layers is a 2-6 player card-based location control board game with some light diplomacy elements. Multiple worlds have suddenly become connected through a network of portals, and you will have a direct impact on their destinies. You play the role of ambassador and strategist, guiding those world's heroes and the forces that support them to take areas of influence and amass support for your cause. Before you begin, each player needs to grab the following out of the box. A player mat, an ambassador token, three diplomacy markers, a ten-sided die, and a faction deck with its corresponding locations. There are three diplomacy track cards you will also need. While you are still learning, it is recommended you use a single full faction deck until you're comfortable with the rules. Later on in this video, I will explain the ways you can customize your deck in your gaming experience. The object of the game is to be the player with the most victory points at the end of the game. Victory points are earned usually by taking locations and by earning influence to gain the support of the people. You will be doing this by playing cards from your deck and sending your character cards to the locations in the middle of the table. To set up, separate your cards into different piles according to their card backs. The orange tarot sized ones are your locations. Place them aside for now. The ones with this back will be placed below your mat as your reserves pile. Your layer cards are placed into your support zone. The rest of your cards will form your play deck. Now, randomly determine who starts the game with the initiative token. Initiative order is determined first by the player with the initiative token, then proceeds clockwise. The diplomacy tracks are dealt face up between all players, and each player places a diplomacy marker on all three tracks. In initiative order, each player shuffles their locations into a single location deck. Once all of the locations are shuffled together, the last player deals out three locations in between all players to create the contested zone. Place any piles of tokens in between all players where they may be easily reached. Players will then shuffle their play deck and draw five cards. You may choose any number of these cards, place them on the bottom of your deck and draw that same number. Once the stage is set and your hand is drawn, look at your reserves pile. Choose a hero and place it face down in your character zone. The rest return to your reserves pile. Once all players have selected a hero, reveal yours and set your gate timer to the value inside the hero's timer. Play then begins. To play any card, you must first pay its cost. To do so, you must discard that many other cards from your hand. For heroes, you will be setting your gate timer to the hero's timer value when they come into play. Whenever your gate timer reaches zero, you get to play another hero immediately. The characters are the people who fight for your cause. They have a cost, an ability text box, and three stats on the side. Characters will be taking damage over the course of the game. The first time it is damaged, place a wound token on it and whenever a wounded character takes damage, it is destroyed. Armor tokens on a character, however, may be spent to prevent that damage. Hero characters are a special kind of character that come into play every time your gate timer reaches zero. In addition to the typical stats, all characters have a hit point stat that shows you how many times it needs to be damaged before it will be destroyed. Instead of a cost, heroes have a timer value. Attachment cards augment your characters. They have a cost, an ability text box, and any bonuses or penalties to stats are listed on the side here. This bottom number is the weight of the attachment. Event cards are the most straightforward. When you play an event card, pay its cost, resolve its effects, then discard it to the discard pile. Encounter cards come into play sideways and are played directly to a location. Place the encounter under the location with the prowess stat facing your side of the table. They act as a barrier, helping you overcome your opponents during the conflict phase. You may think of them as temporary characters, and they take damage just like a character does. All cards also have designators. Designators generally do not do anything on their own, though cards and layers may look for specific ones to interact with. 
At the top of the ability box, there is a field meant for common abilities, or those abilities that are so common they are given a name instead of writing them out every time. Here's a list of typical common abilities you will encounter. Abilities that trigger are also simplified by use of an icon instead of the phrase explaining the trigger. These are Gordian Layers features a shared turn system. A single turn of the game features several different phases that all players will participate in before moving to the next. The first phase of a turn is the refresh phase. In initiative order, each player draws three cards and readies all of their committed cards. The next phase is known as the provision phase. This is where all the decisions happen. In initiative order, you will be performing a procurement act or a deployment act until every player has passed on their initiative. A procurement act is one where you play a card from your hand. Characters go to the character zone. Attachments come into play and attach themselves to a character. A deployment act is one where you commit a character in your character zone and travel them to a location in the contested zone. To tell if a card is committed, you may use these tokens included in the box. Though any method that's consistent between all players will work. You may also choose to pass, though you forfeit your ability to perform any more deployment acts for this turn. Actions are abilities on cards that let you commit them to perform an effect. All actions are considered free and do not take up your initiative on their own. Keep in mind that you still have to wait for your initiative to perform actions. Once all players have passed, the provision phase ends and the conflict phase begins. In the conflict phase, you will be determining the outcome of all the decisions you've made this turn. Resolve the locations, starting from the one closest to the location deck and moving outward. Each location is resolved by performing the following steps. Each player counts how many instances of long range they have on their cards and chooses a player to give that much damage to. That player must assign them to the characters or encounters they control at that location reducing the total number of wounds by the number of cards with shell they control. Let's take a look at this example. In this instance, you can see that the first player has two cards with long range, and the second player has one card with long range and one card with shell. In this example, each player will suffer one damage among the cards they control there. After this step, compare the numbers of the cards remaining in the conflict. If a player has enough prowess to overcome the location's resistance value, the location can no longer defend itself and a conquest is possible. The higher prowess wins the conflict and has a chance to take the location, while the higher charisma wins the diplomacy rewards. What a charisma victory earns you varies from location to location and is listed here on the bottom of the location. Influence gain lets you move one of your diplomacy markers further up the diplomacy track of your choice. While you cannot split your influence you gain, each time you earn influence in a turn you can choose a different track to advance. After you figure out who wins each conflict or diplomatic reward, you can start gaining the benefits. Any player that has completed an influence track returns their marker to the start of that track and performs the actions described below the track. The current tracks could give you a prowess buff token on each of your characters, let you draw three cards for the trade of discarding a card afterwards, and setting up an embassy while getting a victory point. Embassies raise the resistance of a location for future turns. To take a location, the location must first be able to be conquered. Select a number of characters with a total prowess equal to or greater than the keep cost, and move the location to the support zone. Place your chosen characters underneath the location as they need to stick around to maintain control and enforce your policies. After you do all that, the conflict phase is finally over, and you move on to the travel phase. In the travel phase, all surviving characters travel back to their controller's character zone. They stay committed at this time. The gate phase is the next and final phase of a turn. In the gate phase, you will be checking to see if the game is over, you will be replacing missing locations until at least three are revealed, and you will be lowering your hero timer by one, playing a new hero if it reaches zero. If, at the beginning of the gate phase, a player has five or more victory points, gameplay immediately ends and the player with the most victory points is declared the winner. If there is a tie, the player with the most influence still on the influence tracks wins. If there is still a tie, the game ends in a tie. There are two other ways you may use when setting up your game. 
The first is my personal favorite, as it has the most dynamic range of possibilities without requiring too much additional time to set up, though it is best played when you have at least two faction decks per player. In this way, all players will be drafting the layers that make up their deck. Deal all faction layer cards face up on the table, and in initiative order you will be selecting one to go into your deck. In reverse initiative order, you will then be selecting your second layer to go into your deck. This means that if you have six factions and three players, the player choosing their first layer first will be stuck with whatever is left over for their second. Once all players have two factions, you will be selecting which half of the first faction to use with a half of your second. You may have noticed that every card has some gems at the bottom. These gems are called the force divider and divvy up your deck into the different halves that can be chosen. Each pile will have two heroes, two locations, and 20 cards to go along with them. These all should be thematically similar in design and represent the forces following the two heroes. Alternatively, you may build your own deck, though you must follow these simple guidelines to ensure that each player's deck is relatively balanced. First, your deck must contain at least 40 cards. Your deck must contain at least 15 cards from each faction you choose to use. This means that a two-faction deck has 10 cards that can be mix and match from either faction, and a three-faction deck would need to be at least 45 cards. Your deck must have at least one hero from each faction. Your locations can be a combination of from the factions you have chosen. You get to use all of the layer cards associated with each faction.